spiritual anxiety. Now, it's not totally clear in, in movement three of Burnt Garden. If the, the speaker, T.S. Eliot, the pilgrim, if we a poet, if we say it that way, is thoroughly convinced that this kind of thing, recognition, is necessarily a bad thing. Because once you recognize that you're spiritually vacuous, once you realize that you are distracted from distractions by distractions, then and only then can you begin to try and find some solution. And this is going to be a poem. Four Quartets is a poem about solutions, right? Okay. Um, and then he uses, of course, the fun word, irritation, which means burping or belching of unhealthy souls into the faded air, the torpid driven on the wind. And we think about Dante, right, in, in Canto V. Driven on the wind that sweeps the gloomy hills of London. And then he lists several neighborhoods around London. Hampstead, Clerkenwell, Campton, Putney, Highgate, Primrose, Ludgate. By the way, these run the gamut socioeconomically from the very wealthiest to the very poorest. And then he continues at line 115. Not here. Notice we're back to the word here. This notion of place. Where am I? What do you mean, where are you? You're sitting in room 303. Really? Is the room the walls or the space inside the walls? Oh, really? Are we going there? Yeah, because we're always wondering, where am I? Remember Dante, opening lines of Inferno, caught in the middle way. As I said, I think T.S. Eliot understands that he is caught in the middle, and he wants us to understand how we're kind of caught in the middle, distracted from distractions by distractions. Not here, the darkness, in this Twittering world, again, this idea of the Twittering world is hilarious, right? That you, Before he understood that whatever it is you're going to say, you've got to be able to say it in 140 characters or less, you know, that kind of insanity. All of our life seems to be kind of somehow reduced reduced to that. And Twitter and, its, and, 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 of course, all the other kinds of technologies have somehow taken over everything, our politics, our lives, our, our, our personal affairs, and the like. And, again, distracted from distractions by distractions, right? The idea as well that there is spiritual, almost like a spiritual heartburn or belching that is, that is occurring right through all of this. On now to the final lines. Uh, let's go 117 uh, now and, and further. Descend lower. We're back to the Dante idea. Descend only into the world of perpetual solitude. Now, here, we're going to begin to play games with, with contemplative thinkers, especially Christian contemplative thinkers like St. John of the Cross. And the idea is that we're in, in, con, in contemplation, in meditation, we're actually trying to go deeper and deeper, perpetual solitude, back to that notion of Plato hoping with Augustine that we can hold on to something that is perpetual, perpetual solitude, world, not world, but that which is not world internal darkness and then listen to all of the uh, all of the kinds of uh, action that is removing action language deprivation destitution of all property renunciation is is our word here right destitution of all property desiccation of the world of sense evacuation of the world of fancy inoperancy of the world of spirit in other words to try and close out through acts intentionally intentional acts close out the world so that one can find the still point of the turning world. This is the one way. And the other is the same, not in movement, but abstention from movement, what, what again, the, the contemplatives will call the negative way, right? While the world moves in appetency on its meddled way, a reference here to trains, and we'll have trains that come up several times in four quartets, of time past and time <laughs> future, right? The idea, uh, uh, of course, is the challenge of renunciation and to try and get your life in some kind of spiritual order. The negative route to enlightenment um, um, versus the active light to enlightenment, right? Stripping away everything, the dark night of the soul is St. John of the Cross, and we'll have more to say about that in a bit. At 2A, let's finish quickly. The path to enlightenment, let's just say it, is hard, it's difficult, but it's really important, Eliot will argue. Uh, to be the symbolism, well, we're going to look for more symbols of trains in uh, for quartets. There's a number of other symbols that maybe for you uh, come to mind. The notion of descending, right, into the into the lower, into the, the, the world that is, um, you know, uh, perpetual solitude. 
At 3a, well, you have to think about Dante, right? That blown in a whirlwind from Canto V, the lustful of the second circle of hell. At 3b, let's ask this question. What was the time in your life, or how about this, a time in your senior year, when you qualified, you really were distracted from distractions by distractions. You just couldn't focus at all, right? Okay, let's turn now to part four. Now, part four of all four of the uh, of the four quartets, it's it's lyrical, it's short, it's it's a beautiful little kind of poetic prayer. So let's take a look now, and uh, and and we'll pay attention to this one. Very short, lines 130 to 139. So um, see if you can focus just during this little uh, project. All right. Time and the bell have buried the day. The black cloud carries the sun away. Will the sunflower turn to us? Will the clematis stray down, bend to us? Tendril and spray, clutch and cling. Chill fingers of you be curled down on us. After the kingfisher's wing has answered light to light and is silent, the light is still at the still point of the turning world. Okay, I told you that it's kind of short. It's got a beautiful melodic sense to it. Some people have said that this is some of the most amazing poetry ever written. Let's take a look. And we begin now with bells. So if there's going to be a symbol that we're going to concentrate on in part four, it's going to be the bell. Now, of course, we've got all kinds of bells going on, right? Think about, for example, they even start Wall Street, don't they, with a bell, and they end the day with a bell. We think about bells as dominating our life. The bells of our school, for example. Ding, 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 or ring, ring, ring. Whatever that bell is. How our lives are dominated by time. During this very lecture, how many times have you looked over my shoulder at that, at that clock up there? And why? Well, we got to get going. we got things to do. we got to see how time. Time and the bell have buried the day. By the way, of course, if you know anything about monks and their meditations in cloisters, bells are what often will call them, right? You have the different bells for the day and that kind of thing, right? Of course, think of it as well this way, possibly, that the bell can represent the need for money, making money, and how it buries our day, right? Notice the black cloud, we're back to the earlier cloud of part one uh, um, that, that took away the sun, carries the sun away. In other words, we, we have things we should be doing, and we're distracted, and we're unable, right? Um, time and the bell have buried the day. The black cloud carries the sun away. And then there's an interesting rhetorical question. Will the sunflower, think about what sunflowers do. They turn their faces to the sun. We're back to more flowers, right? Turn to us. Will the clematis, another kind of, of flower, stray down, bend to us, tendril and spray, clutch and cling? Many have read this as the question, is there hope? Of course, think about how sunflowers and clematis are mentioned here. Earlier it was lotus and roses, right? These are maybe rhetorical questions. Is it possible that the sunflower will turn to us, or the sunflower will turn to us, or the clematis will bend down to us? And maybe the answer is, well, maybe not. We think immediately of the wasteland, those opening lines, 19 through 20. What are the roots that clutch? What branches grow out of this stony rubbish? The idea is that um, you can only have a good spiritual life if you have good spiritual soil to grow anything spiritually great. Then you have at line 135 the word chill, which is a fascinating single word, chill. And then it becomes the word, of course, uh, is an adjective for line 136, fingers of you be curled down on us. This word chill, of course, seems to suggest that it's hard to grow anything when it's cold, right? Again, the autumn leads to the winter. And again, we think about how our garden, if it is corrupted, then we can't grow anything. Remember those final lines from Voltaire's Candide, right? We must cultivate our own garden. Here we're playing the same thing all over again. The flower of peace will only grow if there is good soil for it to grow out of, right? Now the yew tree of line 136 and following is a fascinating. Go and Google image this if you haven't seen these trees. Several things. One, they, they get really old. It is the tree both of death in literature as well as rebirth. The reason is because oftentimes 
the branches will keep growing long after the center part of the tree is dead and it's, and, and it's, um, and it's gone. They also will grow the branches back into the ground. It's a compelling word picture, and Elliot loved that word picture, right? The yew tree is often seen at cemeteries in Europe. And then you've got the kingfisher, right? Chill, he says, fingers of you be curled down on us. Another rhetorical question. After the kingfisher's wing, another kind of bird, has answered light to light and is silent, the light is still at the still point of the turning world. Now let's point out, of course, the fisher, uh, the kingfisher here takes us immediately to wasteland. T.S. Eliot said that he was very interested in the fisher king of English of English mythology. Remember that whole notion of the grail motif that brings back fertility and all of that, right? Notice the word silent here, again takes us to this notion of it being translinguistic, and notice that the light is still back to Dante and the final section of the Divine Comedy. Okay, let's do some quick uh, levels two and three here. Well, at 2A, right, uh, this spiritual program that we're talking about is beyond words at the still point. It's translinguistic, and yet, notice Eliot is trying to push us to at least consider it. At 2B, well, notice here again, we've got trees, we've got birds, we've got light, all of these images of both death as well as rebirth life. I mean, think about, for example, how the phoenix comes to mind immediately in that count, right? Well, at 3A, we have to, of course, think about the notion of gardens here and trees. Think about the Bible, Genesis 3, Paradise Lost, right? Think about the Romantic poets that played around with birds and the grail myth of wasteland as well. At 3B, this is a powerful image, this image of the yew tree, suggesting that sometimes that bad things will produce good things, right? Think about that one for us. We said that the most important uh, thing in life is to learn how to ask the right question. No longer ask when bad things happen, why is this happening to me? but rather learn to ask, why is this happening for me? Can you think about a time in your life where you had to kind of learn that? And that was a compelling then thing for you to have to go through. And from the other side, can we say it this way now that, you, now that you've read Bert Norton, you get this, you see the pattern. You start to see the pattern, right? All right, now we're about to start the last section, but before we do, let's just go back and cover our territory and where we've been. Let's review. Bert Norton, Movement one, sometimes referred to as the Lotus Rose, this tension between the unredeemed and redeemed time. The Rose Garden, remember we were there. The immediate experience, the insight, the perspicacity that maybe we long for. The epiphany, we might think of. Think about Joyce, for example, in his portrait of the artist as a young man, and that notion of the epiphany. That sudden insight that makes you go, oh yeah. At Burton Norton two, movement two, the still point, right? The quest, of course, is the relief. From the landscape that is external, we then move to the landscape that is internal. The need to rely on paradox, Heraclitus' logos, the, the wisdom that is um, the way up is the way down. Of course, the quest is to remember to wake up. The power of memory, of course, makes us think about Plato's learning theory. Remember he said that learning is really kind of like a remembering of a kind. We're almost like waking up. Bert Norton 3 in the movement 3 is uh, to descend lower, right? The spiritual discipline necessary to purify the soul is introduced in Bert Norton movement 3. Remember, all three of these, uh, all, all, all the movements in the, four, in the four quartets, the third movement is always uh, going to have some kind of a descending or ascending spiritual practice as its centerpiece. The darkness of the London underground comes to mind, right? St. John of the Cross, this is that... Uh, mystical, uh, mystic writer from 14, uh, 1542 uh, to 1591, um, the, the idea of the negative way from the dark night of the soul, the way up and the way down are the same. We're going to hear more about him in uh, part five here in a second. And then finally in Bernard and four, you've got the Kingfisher swing, right? Again, each poem at, at section four is kind of this lyrical devotional poem or song or prayer. We've got death, we've got burial, by the way, remember that for uh, T.S. Eliot, especially after 1927, when he began to take part in the Mass, remember in the Christian Mass, a bell is rung to, at a moment, right, to uh, let us know that the bread and the wine are being consecrated and they become the body and blood of Christ, right, in transubstantiation and all of that. 
The word chill is a fascinating word in that section as well. It's almost like a bell, almost like a gong. Again, the yew tree, both death and new life. We think of the phoenix bird as well. The kingfisher in Christian theology. How about this one? Remember that Christ himself was called a fisher of men. And again, the quest is to have that heart of light as opposed to the heart of darkness, right? Now we turn to Bernard Five. All four poems will end with an attempt at closure, okay? culmination, we might say. Um, the scholar Kramer has said it this way. The fifth part is always the attempt to bring the one end or the one way and unitative awareness hinted at throughout the quartet finally to bring it to fruition. Let's try now to reconcile the paradoxes. Let's look at it now. This is section 5, lines 140 to 178. And one more time, I'm going to challenge you to not be distracted from distractions by distractions. This, of course, lecture has been going on for a while, but let's see if we can focus now the final words, Bert Norton, Movement 5. Here we go. Words move, music moves, only in time. But that which is only living can only die. Words after speech reach into the silence. Only by the form, the pattern, can words or music reach the stillness as a Chinese jar still moves perpetually in its stillness. Not the stillness of the violin while the note lasts. Not that only, but the coexistence or say that the end precedes the beginning, and the end and the beginning were always there before the beginning and after the end. And all is always now. Words strain, crack and sometimes break under the burden, under the tension, slip, slide, perish, decay with imprecision, will not stay in place, will not stay still. Shrieking voices, scolding, mocking, or merely chattering, always assail them. The word in the desert is most attacked by voices of temptation, the crying shadow in the funeral dance, the loud lament of the disconsolate chimera. The detail of the pattern is movement, as in the figure of the ten stairs. Desire itself is movement, not in itself desirable. Love is itself unmoving. Only the cause and end of movement, timeless and undesiring, except in the aspect of time caught in the form of limitation between unbeing and being. Sudden in a shaft of sunlight, even while the dust moves, there rises the hidden laughter of children in the foliage. Quit now, here, now, always. Ridiculous, the waste sad time, stretching before and after. All right, let's turn now to movement five. If you've been doing anything with me that I hope, you know, helps you, by the time you get to the fifth movement, you can kind of start to get a sense of what's going on as you read through these poetic lines. Let's play the game now starting at line 140 to 146. These are often quoted lines by writers, by speakers of words. Politicians come to mind, actors come to mind, poets, of course, songwriters come to mind. Um, it reminds us of what T.S. Eliot said in The Love Song of Jail for Proofrock. It is impossible to say just what I mean. And that takes us to Hamlet's line at the end of his first soliloquy in, uh, in the play Hamlet, Act 1, Scene 2. Um, it is impossible to say just what I mean is, an, is, is somehow going to fit with when Hamlet says, but break my heart, for I must hold my tongue. I don't like the situation I'm in, but I can't talk about it. Words move. Music moves. Of course, we think already about this notion of the quartets, right? only in time. In other words, everything is passing away. That which is only living can only die. I mean, the fact that, I mean, we can say about you that you exist, but not for long. 
Certainly not in that first box, the physical, right? We've said this before. I mean, here I am, I'm up here lecturing away, and all of a sudden I just crank on the floor, right? And somebody says, uh-oh, the old man is gone. If my body could talk without getting freaked out, I would say, I'm not gone, what are you talking about? Everything I was is still there, laying on the floor. Notice our language, right? That is to say, there's something about our existence. The physical existence is inevitably got to die. That's, that's what time is. Time is the recognition of that, right? That which is only living can only die. He then will say, words after speech, notice the, the repetition of certain sounds here, words after speech reach into the silence. In other words, we try to somehow understand the stuff we cannot understand through language, and it doesn't work. Let's put it in our notes. This is ironic, isn't it? At the conclusion of all of these lines of poetry, he's going to say, yeah, words just don't get it, do they? they? They cannot get to the heart of the matter. Only by the form, the pattern, can words or music reach the stillness. It isn't actually the words, it's the pattern of the words. As an interesting simile, a Chinese jar, now again, we think about Keats's Cretan urn in the same way, moves perpetually in its stillness. Now, if you haven't seen these Chinese jars of art, they're quite remarkable, ceramic or some kind of, uh, of material, and around the outside you have these beautiful kinds of drawings, artwork and the like, right? And somehow the jar looks as if it's moving when we know absolutely that it's still. Of course, as we've pointed out, that's a funny thing about Ruthie's tree out that window. Is it still or is it moving? Well, you look at it and you go, well, obviously it's still. Not even a breeze right now is blowing that. And yet, any biologist will tell you what you know to be true as well. That tree is total movement. The molecular, the, at the molecular level, that tree is moving all the time. Right? Art has this tendency to, 